Well, here we are again to talk about aviation. Martin is with me in the Wellington studio. Hello again, Martin. Hello, Paul, in the Wellington studio. Yes, well, what passes for a studio? You've been road tripping around the North Island. I have. I've got a mate visiting from Australia, and we went up to National Park. Oh, that's very nice. It was very nice. I hope you had a good break. It was pretty good. Well, some of us had to uh, work. Yeah, it was only a day. Let's not get too carried away. One day, but still. Okay, all right, plenty to talk about. Um, We really should start with talking about the 737 MAX. Uh, Within the day or so of this uh, podcast being recorded, it has been rolled out. Yes, two weeks to the day, I think, after the A320neo was rolled out. So it's a great time for narrowbodies. Yep. The MAX is being described by some pundits, of which we're not part of as um, the plane Boeing didn't want to build. Ah, Their hand was forced. There was comment that uh, they could be facing a cash flow issue by 2020 because of being forced into the situation. Forced into the situation, 787 hasn't ramped up as quickly as possible and no one's buying 777s for a number of reasons, one of which we'll discuss a bit later. Okay, so the distinguishing features of the MAX is... Wow, those winglets um, are a different shape altogether. It's like a sort of a split wing end, but like a bird's, you know, like mm. you, you watch an eagle, it's like got those... Nature. F- yeah, like nature, there you go. Uh, the interesting thing is that uh, there are still efficiencies to be found at the wingtip. Yes. After all this time. Isn't that funny? Yeah. Yeah, they, they, I mean, I think they, it's going to be a great plane. It's got the, a fancy new wing. It's got... So it's uh, an entirely new wing, is it? No, no, just the wingtip. Oh, right. Yeah, what appears to be a fancy new wing. But yeah. However, it's just the end, sort of 5%, 10%. The cabin will appear a little bit wider because they've sculpted the um, trimmings. Right. And the way they've packaged it, they can cram a few more seats in, which I'm not sure if that's a great thing, but they can get quite a few people in them. Well, I guess the airlines want that. Absolutely. The uh, tail cone is a different um, design, The mm-hmm. uh, where the APU sits behind the tail is a lot more fair than it used to be, a, a lot more pointy sort of. 787 style. Yeah, and it is very interesting that the product, how do you say, um, coordination between airline, well, well, there is no coordination between Airbus and Boeing, is that Airbus is sort of consistently forcing Boeing into developments they don't necessarily want to do. You could say the A330 forced Boeing into the Dreamliner. The yeah. A350s kind of forced Boeing into the 777, and the Neo series on the narrow bodies has forced Boeing into the... Uh, 737 so, so they're Max. on the back foot? Pretty much on the... You, you could argue that they're on the back foot. If they're having to respond uh, or being made to do things, then they're on the back foot. Yes, and after years of dominating the industry, it's quite difficult for the 900-pound gorilla to adapt to yeah. not being the leader. Oh, they must worry them a bit. Yeah, but they'll pull through. You know, they, you know it's Boeing. Oh, okay. you know? <laughs> if it's not Boeing, I'm not going. Yeah. Um, the other thing is that uh, the A320neo is already in delivery, and the uh, MAX has to go through all the flight test program yet. Well, they say it's uh, 18 to 24 months away. So that's, a, again, another huge timing disadvantage, isn't it? So, yeah, Boeing rolled out the 737 MAX two weeks after the A320 was finished its certification. It got um, European and FAA certification two weeks ago. And it can't take that engine that the um, no. Airbus people have got on, which is showing, I think, better figures than anyone ever thought. Yes, it is. It's performing better than expected. And apparently one of the Boeing partners that didn't want Boeing to develop a new plane was GE because they the cash cow is the CFM56, and now they've been forced. They're going to have to put the leap engine on the Max. Which is not a geared turbofan. It's not a geared turbofan, but it's cost GE quite a lot of money to develop, although they're luckily they can spread that development across two platforms, the A320 and the 737. Right, right. But it does mean that these new engines are going to take a while to start bringing in the money that the CFM56 just bought in automatically. Yeah. Also see on orders, uh, Boeing are up around the mid-500s for the year, Airbus over 800. Done very well. Huge, again, a huge difference. <laughs> have done, and and they you can't beat, explain that away. And they beat Boeing on wide bodies too, which is you know it's one thing. A three twenty, new development. Sure, they're going to garner a lot more orders, but on wide bodies, wow. And this is this is what a number of um, industry people have been talking about. They've been saying there's going to be a big hole in the Boeing orders because no one is going to buy current triple sevens when there's a brand new range of triple sevens just around the corner however it's not that just around the corner it's a good three to four years away all going well and the launch customers at southwest airlines yes the 737 max is the eight version that they've rolled out isn't it yeah i think it's the smallest one they're going to build yeah and then yeah. there's the nine which is like the 739 but current the, it's configured model. for up to 200 people Okay. Yeah, and you think about it, that's a lot of people. Where did they find the extra room? Yeah, a lot of contour sculpting, apparently. Okay. And very small galleys. 
And uh, do we know when the first flight is expected? No, they've been very coy about all sorts of things. It was a private ceremony, the rollout. There was no press briefing. There was just it was just a PR event, very small, and that's unusual. Maybe they learned from the seven eight seven fiasco well, of rolling out something uh, that was really just a prop. I think the seven three is pretty much go, isn't it? I mean, yeah. they've built enough of them. All right, so it'll be interesting to see how that uh, test program goes. Whether it will, I mean, they're pretty well practiced at bringing out seven three seven models. Now I think this is the tenth version. Yeah, since sixty eight. It's a long time in continuous production for one type, isn't it? It is, and there's really, you know, obviously under the skin there's a huge amount of difference, but I think someone from 1968 would immediately recognize a 9 Max or an 8 Max. And really this is probably the end of that line. Oh, it, has, last it has to be. Version. So again, you know, Boeing's going to have to respond, and in five to six years they're going to have to roll out a new narrow body. By that stage, Airbus will have taken in a whole lot of money for the Neo. The Neo will probably be reasonably competitive still. And there would have been engine upgrades and, and tweaks along the way. What about C-Series? Apparently that's been seen hanging around Seattle. That's the Bombardier regional jet, I guess you'd call it. Yep. Though uh, some of the seating um, versions are, are up there competing in that class. Um, I wonder if Boeing will eye that as that new plane. Very interesting. I mean, Bombardier apparently offered the program to Airbus and Airbus turned it down. Well, they, they don't need it. They don't need it. They've exactly. got their own. You exactly. Know? Um, but Boeing might need so it. So you wonder if Boeing takes Bombardier and says, right, we might not build these particular aircraft, but there's a lot of technology we want in there. You've got experience with the engine. I tell you what, let's make a 200-seater. Yeah. They already have something that's high enough off the ground and flies and does the bizzo. All right, so that's that uh, big news of the 737 MAX rollout, something we've been talking about for a while in this little lead-up, and now it's happened. Good to see it. All right, um, and uh, close to home quickly, 7879 problem for Air New Zealand. Breaking problem, wasn't it? Kept it on the ground somewhere. Where was it? In Shanghai. Oh, Mm. Well, I guess they can fix it there because uh, China Southern have um, Dreamliners, don't they? Or do they? I'm not sure. Oh, okay, well, someone's bound to have one up there. Well, it's pretty handy from uh, Seattle to get parts to Shanghai anyway. Electrical brakes, aren't they? Yes, and they've had a few issues with brakes on the 787, so this is not entirely unusual. Yeah. Um, long delay, almost a day. Yeah, well, again, I guess it's availability of parts and then checking them and all that sort of stuff. Just hope the chairman wasn't on board this time. Yeah, well, there didn't seem to be so much grumpiness no. as the Hong Kong delay that we uh, had, we talked about earlier. But otherwise, it seems that uh, that operation going pretty well for you in New Zealand, apart from that. No, I think they're pretty happy with the plane. Yeah. Interesting that the 7879 doesn't have a lot of the fancy features that were touted for the 7878, like the laminar flow tail and all that. Apparently, it just doesn't have it. It's all gone now. All right. And um, you'd think that, especially the American carriers, well, they are investing in some uh, new aircraft, Dreamliner, so on and so forth, but... Um, the price of fuel, they're bringing back and refurbishing a lot of old jets. Yeah, 757. It's seven, not a good look. 767-300s. I mean, these are 25-year-old planes. You put a new interior in them, who'll know? No, nah, they're still shaky, noisy. They will be, but, you know, that's the price of oil, and the Americans run their airlines slightly differently, so instead of putting in, you're spending the money on more efficient aircraft and pocketing the profit, they'll just run old things and pocket well, a bit less then, profit. Then you can go back to the desert and get parts. Mm. Cheap. Yeah, and they'll have huge stocks of parts that they probably haven't got rid of yet. It sort of carries on, though, with the slightly threadbare image that they have, the legacy carriers Certainly. in America. Yes. Long term, it's probably not the best thing to do. And who knows? I mean, they've said that they're going to do this. It might just be a stopgap until they get better deals on new aircraft or whatever. But, you know, but to refurbish the planes, they're obviously going to use them for a few years, you'd think. Yeah. Okay, a second life, and you don't have to uh, retrain pilots, is the other thing. It's all that, Everyone you know, knows what to do. Pilot unions and renegotiating contracts and all that type of thing. It's a short-term fix. Whether or not it solves their problems, I doubt it. But Boeing wouldn't like it because they're hoping to sell new machines. Well, and part- like, Hey, these old junkers are in the way of our sales. And Get it, them out. And it's these planes, you know, um, 757s, Boeing doesn't really have a replacement for them. And in a 767-300, if you're just doing transcon, do you really need a 787? And most people would say, no, you probably don't. Mm. Mind you, they might think that they're being uh, not very well serviced as a client if they don't have, you know, they're not flying on good equipment. People aren't that dumb. Yes, but in America, they're all pretty bad. So, you know, you go in someone's nicely refurbished 767-300 or in the United 777 regular I went in, man, that was a shocker. All right. And where are we at on the price of a barrel of oil at 
Wow, it's, 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 it keeps going, it, trending it down, keeps, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was last time I checked earlier in the week, it was 42. And then I read in the in on the web while I was at work. Not that I surf the web while I'm at work. But no, anyway, of course, you know, you've no, got other no, things to do. Other things to do, but it just sort of caught my eye. It flashed up, up. Flashed up on a work site. Yeah, as it does. The, the, the price is, is likely to drop even further. So who knows where it's going to end? Those Saudis would be uh, freaking a bit, wouldn't they? Yeah, uh, yeah. and Venezuela apparently is beyond freaking. Tanking. Yeah. I see the um, more right-wing party have just uh, taken most of the seats in Parliament there, so there's been a pushback against the socialists of Hugo Chavez and um, Maduro. Mr. Maduro. Or well, of course, but, but they didn't win any seats because he said, that if they won, I'm going to ignore it. Oh, okay. <laughs> what a luxury. Yeah, so of course they didn't actually win, <laughs> even uh, okay. though they did. Um, getting back to the fuel thing in terms of the uh, airlines in the US refurbishing old jets, at the same time as that, you're seeing the resale value of some of those uh, airliner models, like 777-200ER, A340, that sort of thing, are down to absolute all-time record lows. Yeah, it's... it's it, you know, just chump change in the airline business. Yeah, and there was a, a very interesting sort of um, exchange between the head of Delta and, and Boeing. The head of Delta stated publicly that, oh, I can pick up a 777-200ER for about $10 million. Boeing strenuously denied this. Yeah, well, they don't want that out. Yeah, then some of the aviation analytics sites went off and found out what a 777-200ER costs, and lo and behold, yeah, you can pick one up for about $10 million. With engines. With engines, however, the price of the engine is not factored into the plane because, and this is what's actually driven the price down, whereas previously you could strip the engines off, flog them, and sell the plane for whatever you could get yeah, for it and still yeah. make a tidy sum. The engines don't actually belong to the plane. Oh, okay. If it's roller, they actually belong to Rolls-Royce, and okay. you've got the whole power by the hour, which, again, makes it really easy to start up an airline. or Because or, you don't need that sort of level of maintenance or, or understanding of those systems in your airline. The engines are guaranteed. You pay your $10 million, you pick up the plane, you pay the monthly fee for the engines and you go this led to further analysis by one of the well-known aviation sites they then did a comparison between the a340 300 and the 777 200 er because the conventional wisdom's always been that the a340 was a lot more expensive to operate Hmm. turns out they are within a few dollars of each other in terms of hourly fees and that was very very interesting and the agreement by these analysts was that the reason this 777 outsold the A340 was largely, largely due to the fact that the American airlines had committed to buying Boeing aircraft in the 80s and 90s. First, there was a formal agreement by a number of the major airlines. I think it was Delta, American and mm. Continental right. as it existed back in the that day. That got shut down by the um, competition authorities in the States. And then there was an informal so-called gentleman's agreement. But in actual fact, these analysts went out and spoke to operators and there's really no difference. Yeah. There were some very interesting comparisons. So the, the Boeing's a lot heavier and can take a lot more freight, but they said on a typical mission, six, 7,000 miles out, they carry a very similar load. The Airbus is substantially lighter, so landing fees, it's yeah. going to cost less. Yeah. So that was very interesting. But yeah, the fact that you can pick up a 777-200ER for $10 million and you'll probably get an A340 if you can get one for probably less than that, that is amazing and not something Boeing wants to hear at all because, as we discussed earlier, the problem is if you can pick up a 777-200ER or even a 300ER, they're not much more expensive. For that kind of money, why would you buy a new one, especially when there's going to be the new 777 series coming out in three to four to five years? You yeah. wouldn't. Oil prices such as they are, you'd go and spend $20 million on a 777-300ER, do it up and fly that. $20 mil. Yeah, you save yourself $200 million. Because they're like... 280 million brand new. Exactly. Oh, get the discount. You probably pick it up for 220, maybe 200, but still you're saving yourself hundreds of millions of dollars. If you had a few rich mates and you were wealthy yourself and you want to start up an airline, you what, get 50, 60 million dollars together. You buy, you get four aircraft, five aircraft, outsource all, everything, hmm. and you're away. What's interesting, you're seeing a bit of this happening already. There's somebody who's hoarding um, A340 600s. Yes, I see. Well, in Germany, isn't it? Yeah, one yeah. of the Germany fields. Uh, yeah. There's about six or seven of them sitting there. It's in Germany, that's right, yeah. yeah. There's seven at the moment, and they think they're all going to Iran Air. 
But the moment our uh, own gets clearance, they're going to do them up and run those. because yeah. Well, they need to update from those old 7.4s and stuff. And right? our own has a lot of experience with Airbus now because they've been operating A320s for a while. I noticed there was a photo this week showing that Iran is now undertaking its own sea check. So they've obviously got the certification for that. Oh, right. Okay. And they're going to go with A340 600. Well, they've had A300s and A300 yep. uh, 600s, for which is long getting on the way Yeah, for a long time. Yeah. And they'll pick those planes up for a song. I mean, obviously, Airbus has a massive problem with their A380. Same applies to them. Why would you buy an A380? Although there are maybe some reasons why you might buy it when you can go and pick up cheap 777s, cheap A340 600s. You'd have to ask yourself. I think uh, when it comes to the A380, it's like you mentioned last program, that um, customers are actually seeking out the product and are willing to pay slightly more for it. And if you're a big airline that requires that sort of branding and that sort of presence in the market, then you've sort of got no choice. There's a few airlines where prestige counts a lot, but for an airline that wants to get cheap bums on seats and they offer me a seat for a 1000 bucks less... I don't mind flying in a 10-year-old 777. Yeah. I can tell you that right now. The hub-to-hub constraint, though, hasn't quite kicked in yet, has it? I mean, when you've got um, slot restrictions to the point where you actually physically can't get anything more into the airspace, Yes, that's surely the tipping point. That hasn't come yet. I don't think it's come yet. No, but interestingly enough, I suppose if people keep flying a lot of older, smaller planes for a lot longer, maybe, maybe the hub restrictions will kick in sooner. Yeah. They will go at some point. They have to. Lucky they've got Emirates as a customer for that one, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, it would probably be dead. Probably would be. Yeah, seven fours definitely dead, isn't it? It's gone. Yeah, it's gone. Speaking of seven fours, there's a story that's doing the rounds. Uh, some of our listeners might have seen it on the news sites or heard it being talked about. The seven four sevens at Kuala Lumpur that seem to have been abandoned. I see they have Icelandic registration, so they're old. Air Atlanta Icelandic uh, machines. Uh, Aaron Greenmore Johansson is the guy who owns that airline. Oh, he must have just left them there and thought, well, you know. Well, they say they're untraceable. The owners are untraceable. So he obviously flogged them onto somebody. Well, maybe, yeah. Yeah, and then, but, you know, what do you do? Park it on the ramp and just wander off? Well, I yeah. guess. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I guess you think, well, you know, someone will do something with them. You can strip them down. But here's the thing. No one wants anything no. of those old models anymore. Absolutely they're done. nothing. They're done. Yeah, absolutely done. But the only one still flying it is the U.S. president. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating. So I guess, yeah, they... They land them, park them, and um, saunter off. That's our hotel chain taken care of right there. That's the three planes, yeah. yeah, That are probably probably nominally flyable, I suppose. One's one's missing an engine, but... Now, you've met Mr. Johansson, haven't you? Yes, I have. He's a really interesting guy, very quietly spoken guy. Him and his wife set up that airline back in the early 80s. Still going. I see they've got about just over 20 aircraft in their fleet, 7.4s, A330, a couple of others and some 7.3, so he's still active. What was his favourite plane? Because he Tri- flew them, it right? It was a TriStar. I think the quote to me was, the best airplane I ever flew in an Icelandic accent. You, so you think he said that? No, I know he said that. <laughs> I can understand him. He was very well spoken, yeah, very, very clearly spoken. Yeah. They do have quite a strong accent, the Icelandic. Yeah. A lilt, a sort yeah. of a... Yeah. Yeah. Interesting guy, and um, run that business for a long time out of that tiny little island. Who'd have thought, eh? Iceland. Yeah. It's amazing. At one stage, I think he had about 30 747s operating around the world. Wow. Of course, he bought the Air New Zealand 200s. Okay. And uh, then um, leased them over to Virgin. Oh. So he had the crews, everything. Which so he's is, a yeah. broker as well. He brokered aircraft. Yeah, yeah, that's right. They ended up with Transero, of course, and we all know that what happened there. I see some of those uh, Transero planes are going to be absorbed by another Russian carrier. I forget yes. the name of it, but I think a holiday charter airline or something. Yes, I uh, read so, that. So they, they live on. Speaking of Russia military, let's make a bit of a segue here. The Brits are in on bombing ISIS. I read that they only have 28 serviceable tornadoes. I guess they'll... With pressing issues, they'll... Yeah, because you know, I know Germany's got the same issue. You know, half their fleet is not actually combat-ready. Yeah. Whether that means they can't fly or whether that means they're going through some sort of upgrade, I don't know. Or but, maybe they can't do the mission in all safety yeah. or have all their uh, defensive systems or whatever operating. But that surprised me. It did. Yeah, it did surprise not me many. too. No, no. They've got a few based down in the Falkland Islands, but I guess they can pull them back soon now that... Um, the government's changed in, in Argentina. Yeah. So, yeah, 28. But there again, you know, they've got a whole they bunch need of... They need a few. They, yeah, you, need, you don't need many. They've got a whole bunch of typhoons. Yeah. And I see they're um, escorting their tornadoes with typhoons. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's getting pretty windy up there. Uh, 
Yeah, her. well, um, what would ISIS, ISIL, whatever they call themselves, what have they got? They've probably got shoulder-launched missiles or something. And Interesting. The, some um, the, air to, uh, some ACAC guns. The, the primary weapon that the, the British are using is a missile called the Brimstone, which is a development Brimstone. of... Brimstone. Yeah. Which is a development of the Hellfire missile, but it's really small. Oh, okay. And um, they reckon it could take out a car at the traffic lights and not cause huge damage to surrounding right. cars. Exactly. The whole point of it, it's pinpoint small and and very very is this, accurate is this trying to get around the collateral damage issue the, the, yeah i mean they say that however being hit by a missile traveling at several times the speed of sound you know, yeah with only 500 grams of high explosive yeah, nose, i'm not sure it's a bit of a nuance isn't it given my car i'm pretty sure the surrounding cars the would, old be quite, Nissan. You know, would be quite damaged as well take a bit of a hit there yeah but yeah. they're very proud of it and it, and it is a very modern apparently was designed for low collateral damage. Um, the um, armament companies, the weapons companies, will be rubbing their hands oh, in man. glee at the moment. There's uh, probably an endless uh, market uh, available there until this thing's I sorted mean, or whatever. The ordnance Russia is expending. I see they were launching a whole bunch of missiles out of a submarine. Okay. Cruise missiles out of a submarine. Yeah. Because they've never, never really had the opportunity to try it. No, well, we've got to try all this stuff oh, out. Yeah, send it all See on. how it goes. Yeah. And then film it and put it in the uh, the video catalog of, of what you can sell. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, Russian Tu-60 bombers with GoPros in the bomb base. Yeah, well, I mean, you want to see what it looks like yeah, and the thing falls out, you know? Yeah. GoPros are everywhere now, didn't you mm. know that? No, I did, but I don't think the Russians would be sticking them in their Tu-160s. Jetstar have been operating their um, regional stuff. services. People are complaining that they're not running to time. No. Jetstar? Well, no, they were the best on-time airline last year. So they, you oh, know, were they a, really? It's a bit of a, a meme that it's... Um, oh, okay. But uh, urban I guess myth. You're, com- you're coming up to speed, aren't you, when you're doing Yeah, I mean, this what news. do you expect? They've never done it before well, in the regions. Half an hour late the other day oh, in my. Auckland. Oh, I mean, yeah. Well, yeah, but you know the media are fishing for any negative yeah, story suppose, about anything. Yeah. In half an hour, you would miss a coffee. Well, you might have that big pitch meeting that you're late for, you know. But if you're yeah. cutting it by fine by half an hour anyway, you need your yeah. head ready. Oh, but if you're doing business at the speed of light like we do, Paul, half an hour, every half hour counts. <laughs> the speed of light. <laughs> yeah. Is that why everything flashes by so quick? Yeah, that's why I don't get up. All right, so um, let's uh, do a quick uh, look at the aircraft of the day. I would like to nominate the 7.3. Your favourite, let's face it. It sort of is my favourite. The though. 200 I like, is I like your favourite. the 200 favorite. model. I think that's the pinnacle of uh, commercial aviation is the 737-200s where it all came together. Yeah. But it is uh, interesting to note, as I mentioned, that this thing has been in continuous production since 1968. In fact, uh, the thinking started going in at about 1960, end of 65, early 66. And there's a famous quote from Bill Allen, who was the head of Boeing at the time. And apparently he said, long after I'm an old man in a rest home, we'll be making this airplane. Well, it even went a lot longer than that because he's long gone now. Yeah. And that was that was back in the early or mid-70s he said that. So start off with the 100. Lufthansa was the launch customer for that. And uh, I think they took 20, 21 um, in the first batch. Yep. That was the city, they called it the city jet, didn't they? they? Did, in the Europe? City, Lufthansa city jet. And of course, uh, ANSET New Zealand got a couple of them when they retired the fleet. And I think it was when the 300s came in. They retired the fleet and, and we got some down here. So we were sort of lucky to have, I think, number two and number four off the line Yeah. here. Number one being NASA 515, which I've been in myself which was used for all the um, EFIS flight deck development that went on in the okay. early days. So there's a cockpit inside the cabin. Yeah, just back. Yeah, with uh, a fly-by-wire. Um, and, and they flew it from there, couldn't they? They flew it from there all the yeah. time, and they had uh, safety pilots in the actual real Looking cockpit. Looking out the windows. And they could switch in the, the two different control systems. Yeah. You know, you can just see the early CRT displays in there and the side yeah. sticks and... It's, it's quite interesting. I, th- I thought the way the engines hung off or didn't hang off those wings were the, like the Messerschmitt um, 262, the way they were uh, embedded in the, in the wing. Apparently the- Joe Sutter is the man behind that, the guy who designed yeah. the 747 or was the uh, lead uh, engineer on the 747. In fact, the patent for that engine layout is in his name. Okay. And I just know a bit about this. They're back in the day, the idea was to put them on pylons, but of course the ground clearance wasn't there. Mm. The solution to the engine issue was to... Get rid of the pylon and snug it right Scab it into the wing, yeah. Underneath, and that worked really well. In fact, it was a very good design. Yep. Uh, the only thing was that uh, on rough strips and stuff, it, it didn't have much clearance. So they, that's where they had the gravel kit. To Which is also there. very clever. And, and those planes apparently still in demand in northern Canada. Yeah, they still fly them around. You can't, you can't land the modern stuff on the gravel strips. And they had a um, nose wheel skid that deflected yep. the stones uh, away from the underneath of the fuselage and the engines. 
and they had that blower in front of the engine. Yeah, cell a little that, pipe that stuck out at about yeah, forty-five so that, degrees. So the little, you know, the vortex up from the ground was broken, and you could yeah. suck stuff in. You know, fired in. And the, and then you had the um, bucket reversers. Yep. Well, they came a bit later. I remember going on a, as a kid seven three seven two hundred in South Africa, and it didn't have overhead lockers. It just had like a hat yeah, rack. Yeah, that's how they came out first. Yeah. And they were actually uh, two three. Yeah, uh, two aisle three or, originally. Um, of course, it was 707 airframe based on the, well, the fuselage anyway. Yep. So you had, it brought quite a bit of uh, of capacity to very small towns and cities. It's, it's what it did. And of course, the 727 flap system was used, the triple slotted flaps. Um, so it had the high lift. The 200 came out. That was the stretch uh, version. That's what we got in um, New Zealand. I think it had an extra two rows of seats. United with the launch customer. Then they brought out the Advance. They had the auto throttles and um, some of the early developments there just to make it more efficient. But they were quite economical on short trips, even the old ones, weren't they? For anything sort of less than 500 well, miles, they were good, even my, today. My, my sister told me, who used to work for Air New Zealand as an engineer when they uh, swapped over the 200s for the 300s here, is that they actually couldn't make a business case strictly for the 300s. The 200s were still a more economic machine to operate in New Zealand on short trips on short trips in the 300 but it was just an old look yeah that and was it, the problem it was a pretty cool old look though oh yeah yeah so um but not many around now you, no. you'd be lucky and even with the hush kits they were very expensive they were about two million per kit uh, so and you lost a bit of thrust didn't you yeah I remember flying and they looked ugly as yeah uh, Nordam, I think, with the company. I uh, flew once in a uh, in New Zealand 73 uh, 200, I think it was ZK NAB, uh, in cockpit flight back from Auckland, and, and they couldn't get it up over 28,000 feet. It just would not climb anymore, and you just had to th- stay there. Sort of sit there. Until ATC, we can't go any higher. Yeah. And it was because of the thrust issue from the uh, degraded performance from the hush kit, so... And then the 300s, that was big. And, of course, we got those. I believe Air New Zealand had the last one off the line. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, of course, we had that displayed, or one of those displayed at Te Papa. That was a great success, by the way. Yes, it was pretty it was good. one of the most visited attractions I've ever had, uh, I've been told. Okay. 400s. We had the 400s here with Qantas. Uh, 500. Well, Air Pacific used to the fly into New Zealand the with The 400, 400 was the same length as the current 800, right? I think so. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. It was the, yeah. The 700 is the 300 length. Yes. Very few sold. And the 600 was, was the, the 200 length. 200 length. Yeah. Very few sold. Didn't that Air Pacific, you could fly to Vancouver on a 737-500, couldn't you? They, yeah, I think they it went was via the longest, Hawaii. Yeah, 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 they went Suva, Hawaii, Vancouver, and then they a 500. replaced it with a 600. They had a 600 wow. for a long time. That would have been a cool flight. Yeah. Because they had quite a range, 600. Yes, Yes. Because they had the tankage of the eight, I think. And and, and now I look at it. The, the weight of a 200. Yeah, you know, we're getting all the way to the, to the end of the line. The 737-9 Max carries more than a 707 I know. further. It's incredible, isn't it? It is. So the old 73, it's like imagine having a car that first goes into production in 1968 and they're still making it. Well, I, I, Coming up 50 I, years later. I don't make my car, but the Volvo 240 did start around then, and I am well, still okay. driving it. Yeah. Well, actually, that's probably not <laughs> a very good analogy because you're, you're a living proof of yeah, that. Yeah, I'm, that I'm that a junker driver. That, that can happen. So that's our aircraft of the day, the 737, which was rolled out, the new version, the 10th version, the Max, this week. And that's all we've got time for, talking aviation again. We'll probably be back before Christmas. We, uh, we could, imagine. You won't be able to stop me, mate. Huh? Definitely back before right, Christmas. Well, okay. <laughs> well, I won't get in your way then. So we'll probably have a pre-Christmas special show. We might look back on some of the highlights of the year. Developments are happening so quick now. They're almost happening in a real time. They never used to before. You know, you'd have one type come out and then there'd be 10 years and then another, another type. type yeah. Now it's continual bang, bang, development bang. all the time. I think Airbus is responsible for, for that way of thinking. But, you know, you see the frequency of changes and updates are... And there's some interesting developments in that front coming out from Antonov. It looks like there might be some Western interest in Antonov aircraft. So anyway, oh, we'll okay. talk about that later. Is that Ukraine? Yeah, Ukraine. Oh, right. yeah. They probably need, they probably need they a bit do, of help. They do need yeah. a bit of help. Yeah. A bit of export help. Yeah. yeah. All right, until um, the next fortnight, uh, Paul Brennan, Wellington and, and... Martin Oaks in Wellington. We'll see you soon. Cheers.